All right, guys, let's talk Pacific Rim Uprising. I just saw this movie uh, Sunday night. I've uh, been a bit busy during my brief spring break to uh, before I could get around to reviewing this movie. And uh, just off the... I want to get this movie all in one go. So I don't want... Nor would I do a spoiler-free review and then I do a dissection... Uh, but this one I kind of just want to do it in one go because I have mixed feelings about the movie. Uh, so, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you, uh, spoilers. Spoilers. <clears throat> uh, so, my initial thoughts on the movie are, it was uh, somewhere between okay and, well, let's just go with okay. Uh... And there's a thing I have in my mind that always tells me that a sequel should never, ever, ever be shorter than the things that came before it. And to me, that goes specifically with books, uh, TV shows, movies especially. That's what I'm really referring to. And... The first Pacific Rim was a little over two hours, about two hours, ten minutes. This movie is about 20 minutes shorter at 111 minutes, so it doesn't hit the two-hour mark. And if you cancel out the main title and credits, it's actually a tad shorter. So realistically speaking, the movie is about an hour and 40 minutes long. Now, the, the to me, the problem with this sequel is... Uh, which we kind of already knew from the trailers that it was starting off with pretty much a brand new cast with everyone else from the first movie either being gone or reduced to uh, smaller roles. And I think that's the thing to me with this movie is one of the biggest faults of this movie is if they had simply either A, explain why a lot of the characters did not show up again, or B, use more runtime to build up the characters we've got. And the movie, unfortunately, didn't do that all that much. I mean, the only character who gets any kind of uh, development, I guess you could say, would be uh, John Boyega's character. And I guess the Kaylee uh, Spaney character, as I used to hear last name, I'm not sure. Which, uh, honestly, is unacceptable. Because while the first movie didn't, the first movie, you know, gave you a hint of where all the characters are coming from to a degree. Namely, Rayleigh and Mako. And everyone else in that movie, don't get me wrong, was not that well developed either. But at least you got a sense of who they were. And why they're doing what they're doing. And the characterization of that first movie wasn't perfect. But at least the two main characters. You really felt what they were fighting for. This movie. Lacks that. Unfortunately. From what I, from what I got from the movie. Uh, there's little to nothing to Scott Eastwood's character. Uh, which is another thing that bugged me. Instead of, waste, instead of having time for character actual development. There's some kind of weird half-assed love triangle. If you see in the movie, you know what I'm talking about. There's a weird half-assed love triangle in the middle of the movie that just did not work. Did not belong there. Maybe it could have, if once again, if you developed it, but they didn't do that. So you probably should just cut that out entirely and develop the characters. You know, develop them, show them train a bit more. There's a lot of things you could have done. That's the thing. By the time the movie gets to the end, and we see the four Jaegers fighting uh, the kaiju, the problem is I'm not really familiar with. Well, let's put it this way: out of the eight pilots, I could I only know one of them by name, which is John Boyega's character. The rest I scratch my head. I mean, and then of course Kaylee's character. So, yeah, like two out of the eight pilots, that's not good. Uh, you should definitely be able to name the characters at least to a degree. I bet you since they were in a movie 
to a decent extent, all his, uh, other pilots. So that's that's one to me. That's one of the biggest problems, and to me, that you know what, that actually is the biggest problem with the movie, because everything else, you know, is not too shabby. I mean, I can't complain about the way the movie looks. I think uh, effects wise, the movie looks pretty good. I know some people have been taking craps on it. I, I don't know. I feel like I'm a decent age. And I've seen a lot, a lot of old, I don't know, maybe my expectations for effects are a little different than other people's because I grew up watching so many old movies, like the Godzilla films and uh, old school movies from the 60s, 50s, and beyond that. Maybe I see stuff, stuff, it doesn't bother me that much, and the CGI to me looked fine. I liked a lot of the robot designs, the Jaeger designs, the Kaiju designs were pretty, uh, I thought they were pretty good too. So the effects weren't what bothered me. The music, I mean, it's not Raman. Uh, I, I'm trying to pronounce his last name, but the composer from the first one, he didn't come back. So the music, the score wasn't bad, it, but it also wasn't very memorable. And from there, I mean, a lot of the kaiju designs are really good. Like I said, I don't know, it's weird to me, you know, people will say we want more monster action and less human stuff, but I think Pacific Rim Uprising shows that you, you once again, it's really important to hit a balance with that. And, and now I'm going to go into super, uh, I mean, if I haven't spoiled it already, but I'm going to head into super spoiler territory. What to do with Mako's character to me was unacceptable this is one of the well yeah if not the most badass character from the last movie you know and they even defied the whole stereotype thing in a movie well uh stereotype cliche should say where the guy and gal have to get together which if you know about the first one in depth the Toro said that's not what he wanted he did not want the movie to end with romance between Rayleigh and Mako because That'd be stereotypical, and it's more about personal growth for them, not just shacking up. The movie kind of subverts all this, and just basically kind of just kills her off real fast, which, ah, I was not a fan of that decision. I really think the movie could have had a very interesting angle of Mako and... Uh, John Boyega's character interacting a hell of a lot more, explaining all this backstory. Wow, Penner, Pen, uh, what's his name? Pentecost had a son? He had a son the whole entire time. Where the hell was he during the first one? And they kind of do explain it a little bit, but not really in depth. And you just don't kill someone like Maka. I mean, if you're going to kill her off, at least do it in the middle of a freaking, I don't know, a big, uh, with her in the pilot seat. I don't know. That's what I was more of expecting from her. I found out she was going to be in the movie. But they didn't really do her, uh, they did her a disservice, what, what can I say? Yeah, that, I mean, that's pretty much how the movie, uh, I mean, I don't know, it's weird. I've, I wish the movie had, like I said, the movie's not terrible by far to me. But is this something I uh, watch again in theaters? Honestly, uh, there's... Too many other movies that I'm behind on seeing, like Annihilation, to me to bother seeing this one again. But I probably will end up buying it for my collection because by the time you get down to the nitty gritty of the action, yes, the action is pretty good. Uh, I have no qualms about the action. It's just the problem is once the movie gets going, it kind of feels like it's over really fast. But that's because the movie rushes its content. You know, Pacific Rim, the first one, by the time it was all said and done, I thought it was a pretty solid movie with some flaws, yes. But overall, very solid, very great action scenes. And between those action scenes are tons of character development, which they probably should have tried to do here also. Uh, so I feel like I'm kind of rambling here, but I don't know. It's a movie that, it's like I said, it's okay. It comes to the middle ground. It's not terrible by any means. I don't think it's terrible at all. I also don't think it's a very fantastic movie, although, once again, I think it could have been a lot more stunning if the characters had been more developed, been just a lot more interesting. They tied it in more with the first one, 
because uh, some other the other aspects of the plot with you know with the drone Jaegers and things like that that was pretty interesting. The cyborg kaiju once again interesting. I thought those were pretty well done parts of the script. I just wish the characters had been given that interesting angle to them, and that's the thing. When you take away that from a kaiju movie, you actually don't have, you can't just have the action. So, it, it's odd to say, but once again, I think the movie's biggest flaw is the characters. Everything else in the movie, pretty good. Like I said, I'll end up buying it on Blu-ray or DVD or whatever when it comes out. Uh, so, overall, I would rate this movie, uh, eh, the lowest I'd go is a 6. And then the highest I'd go, as I always do, would be a 7. Although, I, def I think it definitely reaches around the 6 range. Maybe a 6.5 is the highest I'd go. It's a 6.5, it seems fair to me. Uh, and we, I'm pretty sure there's not going to be a director's cut of this. You don't get director's cut of movies like this, really. So, yeah, but there is a tie-in comic coming out. Uh, once again, this whole notion of tie-in comics is great promotional material, but sometimes you gotta know what to keep in. So, I don't know, maybe some stuff in the, in the comic that will hopefully tie all this together. You know, that's the thing. I read the Godzilla 14 tie-in prequel comic and that was good, but it stood on its own, you know. I didn't feel they needed to shove things from the comic while they were interested into the movie, because the movie, to me, felt like it was already good. It didn't need a bunch of extra human scenes to make it go even longer. I felt content with what we got. You know, great action, great human characters, some interesting moments. So if, if you end up reading the prequel comic and you see a bunch of great backstory that probably should have been included in the movie, well, that's just a damn shame. Now, from what I'm looking up, so far, the movie is actually doing pretty well, box office-wise. It made back its budget in one weekend. So, yeah, and, and the thing is, they did hint there'd be a third one. If you're gonna do a third one, once again, you've got to really make these characters a little more, in, more interesting, Otherwise, once the big battle happens in the third one, I'm not going to really know who the hell is who, and I'm not going to care. I mean, it, it, it can't be a thing in a movie where you're just relying on the star power, and that's it. Otherwise, I'm watching the whole movie say, where's John Vegas' character? Where's Scott Eastwood's character? And the ones that don't even know their actor or actress's name, well, then I'm really not going to pay attention to who the hell they are, if they're dead or alive or anything. Because the third one implies that they're going to go into the void itself. The others, whatever the heck it was called, the alien realm, that they're going to go in there and tear shit up and end the war once and for all. That sounds pretty interesting. But they really need to make the characters better and stand out more. Which is, I don't know, the thing, if you read about the Pacific Rim prequel comic, they actually do this... Uh, I mean, talking about the characters, like, I'm trying to name the name of the character who piloted Striker Eureka in the, see, so yeah, there was a problem there. He was one of the weaker, I like Striker Eureka's design, that was, any scene of Striker Eureka was awesome. The problem was the son who piloted, because kind of just a stereotypical bully, but if you read the prequel comic, he actually has an interesting backstory where his mom was killed, and that's why he is kind of a dick. Hey, that you tie in stuff like that, it explains things, it makes characters more memorable. So yes, as so I am all for a third film, but please, please do not come with us with a shorter runtime than the first now two of them. It should now the third one should be at least as long as the first one, if not more so. And I'm saying yes, especially more so. And hopefully it could be a really thrilling film when we delve into a whole new universe, that of the alien universe. And hopefully Warner Brothers out there listening because, I mean, hey, they just learned an important lesson with, uh, I mean, with Universal did this movie, but uh, in any case, Just League just suffered this fate where if you try and make a movie shorter than the first two and it, people feel kind of a little, you know, let's face it, fucked over with what they got, and it doesn't do so well. And uh, just like something I would definitely, I guess, I don't know, not to get off topic, but it's going to be something I'll be buying 
but everybody knows everybody knows from the trailers and a hell of a lot more stuff that's released online now there's tons of more material that was made for the film so what you need to do is use it I mean, people could talk all the crap they want on just uh, Batman or Superman, but the movie still made almost $900 million, just a few million short, well, I should say $100 million short of 10 to 1 billion mark. So for all the hate it got, it still made a lot of money for Warner Brothers. And the director's cut was very well received, and, you know, I heard it made pretty good money on the at-home market. So, you, I don't know, people, I don't know, the studio has always things that cutting, cutting, cutting is the answer, when it just is not... And uh, hopefully the studio learns a lesson with Pacific Rim 3, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see. We'll have to see where that goes. All right. Peace out, guys.